Hey, what's going on, everybody? How you doing? It's another Saturday morning at 9.30 Eastern time, and you're on with Performance Shift uh, podcast. And so welcome, Kat. Thanks for being back. <laughs> Thanks for having me, John. <laughs> I'm not having you. <laughs> We're having We're each on, other. We're in this thing together. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you ever wonder what it takes to achieve remarkable success to overcome obstacles and transform your performance in the face of big change, then you are in the right place. As John said, this is Performance Shift, the podcast where we will take you on a journey of discovery, exploration, transformation. Nothing small happens here. We are going to give you the tools to navigate your own moments of change, whatever they may be. Yes, and I'm John Register, a two-time Paralympic athlete, a combat army veteran, and author, and she is... Uh, an organizational consultant, an author, and improviser, which I cannot say after you say all the things you are without <laughs> feeling like those are very small things, although no, I'm excited and proud of them. <laughs> yeah, very proud is that we, you know, we come together to uh, share our expertise and insights on how we can navigate change and find success in the face of adversity. Yeah, I'm especially excited today, as wonderful as our guests are uh, today, you are both a co-host and a guest, John, in essence. I get to interview you about this five-step framework that is the foundation of all of your work, helping folks navigate big transitions, which is really our promise with the work that we're doing here. Uh, we've referenced it a few times back in episode one, you sort of very did a quick pass through on it. Um, but I was thinking it really deserves a deeper dive than that. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I've requested of you that, that you do with us today um, is to give folks a, a more robust look at that model. So I, I thought maybe we could walk through it step by step and then uh, we can see where improv fits into it at each stage if that comes up. Yeah, I love that. Um, I think you know, we have been refer re referencing it and, you know, having people just kind of come in on, if you come in the first, you know, two episodes that we did, you kind of get the framing of what we are doing. So pin those, those podcasts up there so that you can understand where we are. I, I, you know, I think to, to, to really understand the framework, you have to understand my story. And so I'll, I'll, I'll go over the story just really lightly uh, so that there's a framing to the framing. And my story is really this, this riches rags to riches story line, which begins at the University of Arkansas, where I was a four-time track and field All-American on my way, destined to make the Olympic team. That was my big goal. That was my big dream. That's what I wanted to do. And it wasn't one of those pie in the sky dreams of, you know, maybe that'll happen in the future. No, I saw it right in the, the environment that I was in. I saw athletes, you know, Michael Conley came back and was uh, my teammate um, and he was an Olympian. And we had, you know, Frank O'Mara, an Olympian from Ireland. And we had so many others that were Olympians that were training right there with us. So we knew what it took to get there. It was just a matter of time before the body could do what the brain was thinking. So that's the path I was on. I went to two Olympic trials, went to my first Olympic trials in 1988 in the high hurdles, finished up 25th. The United States takes three. So the, the Olympic trials for American athletes means that that person has met the Olympic standard. So the Olympics themselves have the standard. So I met the Olympic standard. I could have gone to any other country that didn't have a high hurdle spot because I met the Olympic standard, competed for that country in the Olympic Games if I could have you know, jumped to an, another country. So that's what that means. So I wanted another four years and I began, I, I joined the United States Army because they had a Army's world-class athlete program, which allows a soldier athlete to train two years prior for prior to an Olympic Games. Uh, so I made that program, but on the way to Presidio San Francisco to train, I was called up to Operation Desert Shield, Desert Storm. So my whole <laughs> life was distorted. It was taken in a whole different direction. But another level of expertise, you, you become a professional as a soldier now. So now at the highest level, how many people actually go into in, in the army or in the military and actually see combat? You know, so that's the, that's a whole different level of, of um, thing that we're thinking about in, in, that, in, in, uh, in that context. So I learned a ton about myself uh, in moments of intense stress that you must get the job done uh, because if you don't, people might not make it back. 
that is the the level and no one comes back what I, the biggest thing i learned is no one goes that goes to theater whether they've been in war or not whether they've been in combat or not actually comes back the same way so there's a delta that happens between so that person I, and the I, I have to stop you I, there's so much to talk about and i know we haven't even started like phase <laughs> one of the part of your story where we usually start to talk about this framework but yes we've had i mean we we've chatted weekly for now three years well, or so we started yes. early in the pandemic and i don't know that i've ever heard you tell that part of your story exactly like that mm. so i have to just pause for a minute to say that you you know you enlisted for this specific program in the olympic trials is what i just heard you say and then you were called up to combat yes so <laughs> when we talk about navigating change or dealing with an unexpected shift in a life, like that is a major one, right? We're gonna talk about mm. some other major ones in your life story, but I'm just wondering if we can pause for a minute and talk Absolutely. about that. Yes, so here's the deal. I was, you know, I didn't think I was, the war was about to start, but I didn't think I was gonna get called up for the war. And, you know, the first Gulf War we're going, and here's the reason why. Because when I read the op order, the operational order, um, the, the people that were non-deployable were people that were in school, like a military yeah. school, uh, those that were a loss to their unit. I mean, they're going to be transferring to a different unit. So they want to get them to the next unit to yeah. maybe deploy them from that location. And third, they were the only ones kind of of, they were not access to, access to their jobs. And I fit every one of those categories at the time. I fit every one. I was in primary leadership development course because I love being in the military. It was something I never would have thought that I would have liked. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it, was, it was a means to an end when I got in. I went across the parade field in, in, at Fort Jackson, South Carolina, and I, I got it. I understood this whole fraternity of, you know, uh, this, this brother sisterhood of those that have gone before me. Yeah. Um, to protect America, whatever that means to, to yeah. people. Right. So I, I just got it. I understood it. Yeah. And I wanted to be a part of that. So that's I was want to be a lifer in the, in the military. Yeah. But at the same time, I still wanted to do what I wanted to do, <laughs> you know, because I did come in for that uh, to, to try this. And so I was in primary leadership development course. I was a loss to the unit. I was about to transfer to Presidio San Francisco to begin my training and the job I was working in. I was one of two E4s, uh, enlisted four, bright grade of four, um, that were only authorized to work that job. So we had like two other NCOs that were E5s, E6s working, but they were the excess, right? They Because they were over the grade that needed for that position. So they were excess to that job that was actually needed. Yeah. So all three of those were done. And I was, uh, I was since I was gone to PLDC during that time, primarily, primary leadership development course, they all voted and I got the short straw and didn't get a chance to vote. Yeah. <laughs> oh no. So, so I was the one sent over and I did, I resisted it. You know, I did, I'll, I'll, I'll be totally honest. I didn't want to go to combat, um, not, but you know. Not a uh, of course, not I, someone like me, I guess. But. I mean, it, it scared me. It, that didn't scare me. It scared me when I said, and this is why words are so important. When I said to myself, when I got called out of my school, to one of my battle buddies that was there, he said, "You know, you know, go get them. You 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 got this, and, and let's get let's get together when you come back." And then I said, "Yeah, if I come back." And I kind of said it throw throwingly, like a joke. And then the words hit me. So it was so grave that I might not come back from this, yeah. right? And I I lost it. I was like, oh, no. and so my wife came over, and my son, and so I was boohooing on the on the thing. Uh, and then this amazing experience happened on the flight out to uh, Fort Sill, where I was about to deploy, where um, where this this voice, God's voice, just kind of came over me and said, "Look, you want to see your fruit, <laughs> and you know, if you in our my faith, you know, it's it's you, you're going to know people by the fruit that they bear." Uh, and so that was one of the things that one of my prayers. I wanted to see my fruit. Was how was I being impactful in in my life? And so he said, I'm, I'm, I'm sending you there to see your fruit. And he actually showed me the exact process of how it happened. So I knew 
my going over there was not necessarily for the war. It was actually see my fruit and I was coming back. And that gave me this peace that was un indescribable. It was just this peace. Um, so yeah, so that's how I got over there, but I, I learned a ton, you know. Spoiler so, alert, you came back. Here I you came are. Back. Yeah, I'm here. I'm here. <laughs> Thank you for letting me <laughs> take that little detour. So please continue. You came back. Yeah. Well, so so, so what I get comes back, back comes next. So th what's next is I come back from the war and now I'm I'm not in the best, I can't run the high hurdles anymore because I'm I, I'm not a I have lost my rhythm in the race. So I was a 13-4, 13-5 high hurdler. And if I go down like another half a second, not yeah, about a half a second to 0.4 seconds down, I'm going to be in the finals to make try to make this this team. And so you got to keep that rhythm going, and it just you just perfect the rhythm. And I couldn't do it. I, I was I was back up to like 13.8, 13.9, and I just could not get the rhythm back down again uh, in the in the hurdles. So my coach uh, switched me to the 400 meter hurdles, and in my fifth race ever. I actually wound up making the Olympic trial standard in that race, went to the Olympic trials and finished 17th. So 25th in, in, um, in the high hurdles in a race I've been doing all my life. Um, and now I'm 17th in a race I've been doing five times. Wow. So, wow. <laughs> so I knew and, I said, this is it. I got and I, it. And I also just have to pause. Like the, we're talking about a half a second. I mean, the, it's just so noteworthy, like the tiniest, tiniest little margins at these elite levels, like the, you know, the thousand people or so who are these elite athletes. I don't know how many the group is, but it's so you're all just so amazing. Right. And then the little tiny, tiny little nuances between it's just astonishing, isn't it? It is. And it's the increments that you're looking at. You're not looking sometimes. <clears throat> Winning the race is not the objective. Right. It's working on the one thing that's going to get you to win races, yeah. right? Uh, so you kind of throw some of those things away. And, and, actually, and actually, my coach screamed at me after because I was feeling so good in these 400 hurdles. And I was so, um, I, I could see the pathway. And so he said, in this race, all I want you to do is run the first three hurdles really fast and then just kind of cruise the rest of it and then close the race really hard. Mm -hmm. So in this race. And so I felt so good. I ran the first five hurdles really fast and I couldn't close the race. And so <sighs> he, he just totally, he, he, he tore into me like nobody's business because what he was trying to teach me or teach my body was how to close the race. Right. So that was the objective of the, the race. It wasn't to win it. It was right. the objective was the objective was to close it. The objective was to sprint past the finish line when you're, when you're really tired. When, yeah. the, when the lactic acid build up, you're going to train your body to push through that moment in time. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. I have to stop interrupting you. There's just yeah. everything you say. I want to have an entire conversation about. Oh, well, we, we so, can have a conversation. You've had we're, 17, we're, you're 17th in this race. You've run five times. Then what happened? Uh, so Don't then go. what happened? <laughs> da, da, da. And I guess we have, um, we got Carrie Abbott just came back. Hey, can we have, we got Carrie Abbott just came into the chat. So uh, we got to say hello to Carrie because she was our guest hello, last Carrie. week and she's an amazing, brilliant confectionaire. All right, back into the back, episode back into the story. four. Go watch it. <laughs> episode four. <laughs> um, so now I go to the Olympic trials. I'm in the race with Kevin Young, world record holder. And I get out of the blocks, you know, and I'm going as hard as I can. I say, I'm looking at Kevin. I'm like, gosh, he's really a good hurdler. <laughs> he's side in front of me. <laughs> I'm watching the best hurdle race of my life. It's just, um, and I finished, you know, like fourth, I think in my heat, I need to finish third to advance to the next round, but I was, I was good. I, I had my race. Um, and then I went to Germany for work for the army. And I was, I came back from Germany. Actually, I, was, I was training in Germany as well in the, in the hurdles. And when I came back, I ran my first sub 50 second hurdle race in the 400 meter hurdles. So I knew I, I could see my trajectory. I needed, I wanted to run like 48 flat, right in that area. And that, and that was doable. You know, I just needed to get my body to do what my brain thought it could do once again. Um, and that would put me in the finals. I knew for Atlanta and, and possibly make that team. Won't say I would have made the team. I'm just saying I would have been in the finals for sure. And yeah. anything happens in the finals. Right. Um, so right. that's, that's what I, that's what I was pushing towards. And then on May 17th, you know, 1994, as I was training for a, a hurdle race, uh, the next day in Hayes, Kansas, I misstepped a hurdle uh, in, a in a training session. I dislocated my left knee, B 
behind the artery was discovered that I had I had I had, I had disrupted the flow of the of the blood flow through that artery to the lower portion of my leg. And subsequently, seven days later, we made the elective decision to amputate the leg because I was going to be left with a useless limb. So here I was, world's one of the world's fastest hurdlers, had a dream. I saw the I saw the vision. At the same time, parallel, I'd wanted to be a lifer in the military. I had taken the officer selection battery test. I'm on my way to officer candidate school. My battle buddy, who's going to go to school with me, Ben Curitan, he's there with me. And my whole world is snapped in one misstep in life. Oof. Yeah. So we don't know what's going to happen in, in our lives, right? Our lives can shift with one wrong step. And how do we kind of quote unquote hurdle that adversity? We don't, I don't think in the, and we'll talk about the framework in a second here. I don't think we just jump to the next thing. And it took me a long time to unpack that. We just don't jump to the next thing. In my life, my wife really came alongside me and she said, you know what, John, we're going to get through this together. And eventually she said, yeah, we're just living a new normal lifestyle now. And I've used that as a forward progress, a forward progression of that the new normal is not a plateau, but it's a destination by which we grow. Um, it was, it was, that was the challenge was to how do I, how do I now move forward with the new information? And so I started swimming. I knew I started going back to what I knew sports, just getting engaged in a process. And I started swimming for physical therapy. I interned my service in the military. I got out of the military and I started working for the Army's world-class athlete program. And I, as I swam for physical therapy, I got so fast in the water that I somehow messed up and made the Paralympic swim team. <laughs> <laughs> the parallel games to the Olympics. And I didn't even realize I had made the team, right? I, 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 swam, I, I swam one one hundredth of a second slower than what I needed to swim to make the standard for the Paralympics. And I was on top of the world because I never thought I would even come that close. But my flip turn at the 50 yards, the 50 meters in the 100 meter freestyle qualified me because my time was faster than it was needed. And that was a bona fide time that they could actually count. So they picked me up for the relay team. And we can unpack that later. But it was at those games I saw athletes running with artificial limbs. I said, I have to get one of those. I had a leg made for running. And four years later, I wound up winning the silver medal in the long jump in Sydney, Australia. So the finality of it all, there we go. Right. So we win that. So we think that's it. But that's not. Remember, our our our, our rewards, our successes are only plateaus by which we grow. Yeah, so yeah. But that, you won right? a silver medal in the Paralympic <laughs> Games. Crazy. <laughs> so the dream I had starting out as Olympian paralleled at the on the Paralympic side. Yeah. And now I get hired by the United States Olympic Committee to build out a youth program, but the, another war has just started. And we're getting casualties coming back from theater. And I have on, on the outside of my board, I have all the casualties that are coming back because I know that from that firefight, having been in war, there, there were other people in that firefight that survived. Yeah. And they're going to come through Lawnstuhl, Germany, back into Walter Reed, and uh, that's going to be their, their triage. So I started and founded what became known as the Paralympic Military Sport Program to help these wounded, ill, and injured service members use sports, as I did, as a tool for their rehabilitation. Now, that's not a new concept. That was actually formulated by Sir Ludwig Gutmann in Germany um, when he, he escapes uh, Nazi Germany, comes to England, and he starts the program there for these injured service members from World War II. And for but there were primarily spinal cord injuries. And he starts, he's the father, what we call the father of the Paralympic sport movement and, and kind of rehab sport. Uh, and so I kind of used that for a, a blanket. I brought that back again in the United States. It turned into Warrior Games. And then later on, some people might know Prince Harry's Invictus Games. Mm -hmm. So that I'll, I'll stop the st story kind of there. But the person going into this framework was I started telling the story about my life. And people were feeling sorry for me about the story. And I said, well, that's not the response I want. So I began working on the story so that th that would not be the response and really try to answer the question of what was it that I truly overcame. So everybody, well, you, you, you overcame so much adversity. 
but people th thought that the adversity was my overcoming the amputation. And I would say, had I overcome the amputation of my left leg, I would have my leg back. <laughs> right. <laughs> and that's the first, that was the first thread right. to this model that we'll talk about. Yeah. Um, I, it strikes me that what we're talking about right now is your fruit. Yes. yes. It continues. Yeah. Prayers continue. They just don't stop when the when that one, the one thing is answered. They continue in, in existence. Our first guest, Garrett uh, uh, Reisman, on episode number three, he said that the universe, when he's out, he's an astronaut. He's in outer space. He is um, outside of the the, the 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 international space station. He's hanging on in front of the whole thing where there's nothing in front of him. And one of the the most profound things he said was that the universe continues to expand and how small we are in it. Right. So when it's, someone says, let there be, it keeps on going. It keeps on. That's why you can't see the end of it because it's it keeps on expanding. So everything a part of our life continues to expand, whether that's the positive of our fruit or the negative of our fruit. Yeah. Every seed that we plant is a seed that will grow into some, some way. That we, Whatever it is we plant, it will continue to grow. And, and just, even just in your story so far, and we're about to talk about this framework that you created and that you're socializing and that we're about to share even further. So that's a fruit, that's a seed that you've planted that's bearing fruit. But these games, it, you know, the, the um, warrior games and um, all of this work that you're doing with injured service men and, uh, and women is just... I mean, that's amazing fruit. So I just have to pause and say it's it's, it's, it's bl mind blowing to me. Yeah. yeah. Right. Uh, that when I see that, I know exactly where it came from. Right. And I don't, I don't run that stuff anymore. I don't do that. It's not, it's beyond me, you know. Um, but the, but it continues to go on. Yeah. Right. And legacy. And it, it just keeps on, it just keeps on going. And I'm, I'm so it's I'm so amazed. So that took me on to the other work. I won't get into that. <laughs> what I do with our State Department because I ran into some roadblocks and started something else. Um, but the there's framework, more, folks. Yeah, so there's more. Wait, there's more. <laughs> okay, well, 1995. You can. <laughs> and uh, we promised people a, a deep dive into the framework, and we haven't even quite gotten there. So <laughs> let's let's. We'll go in the framework now. So let's yeah let's let's dive in. So the framework really is think about these R's that are, I'm going to share a lot of R's with you because my last name's Register, R, Register, Resilience and all these things. But beyond the resilience, the, the framework really came from how did you overcome the adversity? And I said, I didn't. Because had I overcome the adversity, I would have my leg back. Mm -hmm. So then what do we overcome? What did I overcome? Which becomes what we all generally overcome when it comes to some type of trauma that impacts our life. And so it's, it begins with Something's going on in our life, it's everyday, typical occurrence of something that's happening. And there's a catalytic moment that breaks what's going on. So uh, an injury on the track, for example, uh, uh, the death of a loved one, perhaps a, a repositioning of your job. Either you get a promotion or you get let go. Uh, a transition from high school to college, college to the workforce. Uh, a, a professional athlete going from professional athlete back into, you know, being a civilian and all these identities that have been associated with us. And it shifts. There's a break that happens. Most people will say that the next phase is I accept what's going to happen, but we don't. What usually happens is we say to ourselves, man, I just wish things would go back to the way they were. Great. So, a couple of things I'm noting here in this. So first of all, what is this first phase called? What's the R? The R is the reckoning moment. Thanks for bringing that back up. The, the R is the reckoning moment. We must hurdle the reckoning moment. Great. And what I'm noting about this is it doesn't have to be something that necessarily is labeled as terrible or unexpected or even undesired. It, you know, some of those things are things that we might label as unexpected or undesired, like your injury or the death of a loved one. But other things you mentioned are a promotion or going off to college or starting a new job, right? Any kind of big shift 
or change can trigger this dynamic. Is that right? That's exactly right. And so somebody might be thinking, well, how does a promotion need like a, a framework around resilience? It's because have you ever gotten to a job and you didn't think that you, you, you're around all these other new people and like, oh my gosh, wh- how did I get here? Right. And there's this imposter syndrome that, that comes in. But you deserve to be there because you were promoted there because of the skill that you have. And then we get around all these other people like, oh, my gosh, I don't deserve to be here. That's that's negative self-talk that we have for, for ourselves. Brilliant. Yeah. Okay. So so that's the first thing. So once we can get over that, once we hurdle that adversity, all oh, these folks are coming in. <laughs> um, I'm going to we'll get back to you all in a second. <clears throat> I say I want to honor you all. Once we hurdle that. Um, reckoning moment. Now we're into the revision. R E, uh, capital R, lowercase e, capital V I S O N. Right. So revision. We are now repurposing our vision, uh, and that begins with this um, kind of like this. We're rebuilding, or we're re- we're recalibrating right around what we what we know. We're and we're we're wrestling with it. It's not that it's there. It's not all we formulated out. We're wrestling with it, but I, with it. But I know I see this direction is better than that direction. Mm-hmm. I, I can't go back the way it used to be. I want to be this way. Um, and the, the revision needs to be hurdled with a commitment to the vision that you know you have to do. So and, we had a vision. We knew what we were we doing. Something happens. There's a new reckoning. So now we have to have a new vision, a new picture, because we have to let, we have to recognize the old one doesn't, isn't relevant anymore. Not exactly. only it's not relevant, we can't get back we can't to the way. Do it. We can't, we can't it do it. Exist. It can't. And that's a revelation, like right? It's a revelation for us. We haven't made a commitment to the new, but the revelation is I can't get I can't get that back. Got I'm it. not going back to the way it used to be. It's 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 impossible to go backwards. But we don't know that. <laughs> because and it's so hard to go to to hurdle this one. It's the second hardest part of the model, the the revision of the jump over the revision hurdle. It's very difficult because we have three things that hold us back. And I'll do it the sign language way. Three three things that hold us back. Um, The three things are other people. That's number one. Other people who believe for us what we can or cannot do, which is based on what they believe they could or could not do if they were in our situation. Mm. That's the one. So a doctor says to me, you'll never run again. That person is a person of authority in my life because I I don't know. I've I've never been an amputee before. And the the limited knowledge that he or she has projects onto me my capabilities. The mother or father that's talking to their child in a negative way. Oh, you'll never amount to anything. You, You can't do it because they haven't done it. But the opposite is true as well. Some of that actually elevates you. Alice that says to me, it's just our new normal. So that's the the challenge. We have to, that's other people. And they're they're usually the ones that are closest to us because when dreams are being birthed, when visions are being birthed, they're very fragile. They're very fragile. The second thing is society. Society begins to press upon us or dictate to us the normalcy of what the norm is. You know, how do we operate in our society, in our eco chamber, whether it's on a job, that might be a society, whether it's as an entrepreneur and you're working for another client, that's a society, uh, or society in general as, a you know, the United States or the world. How do we operate? And oftentimes, and I'll keep it on the, in the storyline, somebody has told me or society has dictated how I'm showing up in the world. So, for example, I'm six years old. I'm watching Walt Disney uh, with my popcorn and I'm eating it <laughs> with my family and and I see Peter Pan come on. And the villain in Peter Pan is Captain Hook. Captain Hook. And so how does Disney make Captain Hook look? Why is he scary? Because he is an amputee. He's an amputee. <laughs> He's Hook. got his arm bit off by who? Do you remember? The crocodile. The crocodile. TikTok, the crocodile. And he's there as the antagonist of Peter Pan. Yeah. 
And so society has told me that people that are deformed are to be the antagonist in our stories. Sure. So we, every Halloween, we see Freddy Krueger. And he's burned over his body. So he's a burn survivor. And he's distraught. His mental anguish around it is showing up in children's dreams to scare them to death. Yeah. And we, we find it hard to reconcile this when we have, take my military career again, individuals who have been burned over 90% of their body protecting our freedoms. And after they get scrubbed down at Walt, at, at Brooklyn Medical Center, one of the premier burn survive centers in the country, they are sitting across the table from their loved ones, their wife or their husband and their children. And society has said, you are the nightmare in your children's dreams. <sighs> Thank you for your service. Right. That is it is this belonging. And, and we wrestle with that because that's been ingrained in us. And now I see myself as this. And it's very hard to make that revision commitment because society, what society has dictated to us, it's very hard to make that. Yeah. Uh, and the third thing is we are the ones that have to make the jump. <laughs> we are the ones that have to actually hurdle. No one else can do that hurdle for us or you or however you want to frame that. So I had some of the best hurdle coaches in the world. They trained me to the Olympic Games, the Olympic to make the Olympic standard, which very few people make. But neither of my coach, any of my coaches I had ever ran over a hurdle for me. I have to actually have faith that I can attack this hurdle and things will be right on the other side millions of times over and over increasing speed to attack the hurdle. And it's that's terrifying. Oh, it's, it's terrifying. terrifying. You're hurdling your body and you have to leave the ground attacking this barrier that's in front of you. You have to attack this barrier. We have, you know, <clears throat> one of the greatest football going to go. He's going to end up to be an NFL hall of famer with Tom Brady. And he can't leave the game. How many times have we seen that? I can throw a football down the field to these 11 guys and I can, I can be the best, but I'm terrified of my identity outside of that football field. So you're saying uh, may, that Tom Brady has this incredible courage. He has this incredible accomplishment, but the courage to make a leap, to make a jump, to transition is hard for him is beyond his, you know, it, is something that's even harder than all of the incredible accomplishments that he's got. I mean, I, I don't know him, right? right. But I see I, for that's example, reading the in, paper, this, for, in this example, the, um, what I read in the paper is that his wife wanted to come back home because he's going to be done with it. And he says, I can't, I can't deal with this. I got to go back to the, the gridiron. Yeah. His wife leaves him. He sacrificed his whole family because he can't make this transition. Yeah. That's, and it's, not, that's, that's just an example because we know him right. as, a, as a public figure. Right. But what about us? Yeah. We often forecast it onto somebody else because we can't do that ourselves. Yeah. You know, there's a, I was just listening to an interview with John List, an economist who has, a new book out, the name of which I won't remember, I'll put it in the show notes, about quitting and um, the value, how much our society, you're talking about society. And one of the things that our society has done, I think, is have a, ter a terrible um, shame around letting go of things. We are, or, you know, being a quitter, like what's the... Um, uh, Vince Lombardi, speaking of fit football, right? Like quitters, winners never quit and quitters never win. Is mm -hmm. that the quote? Yeah. And, um, you know, in some situations that you're talking about, like you have your leg amputated, you don't have a choice. You have to give up certain things in some ways, right? It's forced upon you. But in other ways, you have to make 
an internal choice, I'm hearing you say, to release things, to let go of them. And um, we have such societal pressure to not do that. Right. And in other situations, we don't have to, we're not forced to, but maybe we should, right? That maybe releasing something in order to make a transition to something else, like in Tom Brady's case, is actually the it's time to step into the next phase. It's time to make the transition because it's better, but there can be all this uh, fear of what's next or the unknown or that infinite universe that you're talking about. And it's terrifying. Yeah, it's terrifying. I mean, even I think even for myself, right? I mean, we're talking about it, but going back into the moment, into the moment where I have to make this choice i know that it's going to be you know whether i keep this my artificial keep my leg or amputate it right it's a, that's a definitive choice it's not I, I don't get that back and once he makes a decision once we make that decision we don't get we usually don't get that thing back mm -hmm. dr um nadia zexenbayeva she's out of um kazakhstan a uh, brilliant woman and she's recovery um recovering academic uh, ceo whisperer award-winning author all these amazing things about her and one of the things she said i won't go into her whole, whole whole story is that the the best time to transition or to move to the next level is when you're at the top mm. and not don't wait for the change to mm -hmm. begin to come mm. because usually that's too late to mm -hmm. get the rebound back on it so when you're really at the plateau, that's when the, you're that's when you break everything and try to get to the next level. So you keep on the, this elevated climb. And I was like, wow, that was <laughs> that's really brilliant. Um, she was reading my notes. <laughs> no, she wasn't. <laughs> um, really, really fantastic way. And so we we see some other athletes that did that, right? And we keep the athlete to athlete. Jim Brown did that. You know, Jim Brown was at the top of his game, football player, and he left at the top. People say, yeah. why are you leaving? You're you're the best. Yeah, huh, you do something else now. <laughs> Right. And so and he shifts into acting and he shifts into advocacy and he shifts into activism. All these things that he did, you know, uh, not by, with not going the, the distance to the end of the career, somebody saying it's the end of his career. He kept that, you know, for himself and he was in control of that it makes a shift faster. Like I said, this is, this is hard to do. This is not easy. Any any resilient speaker out there that's telling you this is easy and you just follow these three steps, and you can do it. <laughs> Right. Run the other way because this is deep hard work. It's deep hard right. work. Yeah. So, what? Where are we in our framework now? So, which steps? In the framework. Are we in? in the frame, we we've just jumped. We just hurdled the 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 revision, and now we're in the rebirth. Hardest part of the model. Because in the rebirth, we're in the we are in the new. We have made the commitment and a commitment, like I said, when I take my leg off, when the doctor takes my leg off, I don't get it back. That's the commitment. We cannot get back. That's the difference between the, the reckoning moment and the and recommitting to the vision. We cannot go back. In the reckoning moment, we can go back to the way it used to be. We can try to go back or we're thinking we can go back. In this moment, we cannot go back. Our back's against the wall. There is no point of return. Right. That's the burn the ship model and all those things that the ships are, are, are burned. You can't go. You cannot go back from the rebirth. You are now reborn. You are you are moving forward. So this is um, the framework around this. What Alice said. Right. The new normal. This is just our new normal. Now, I, I realize that people are kind of jaded with this term because of the pandemic and it's been overused. Uh, and but I challenge even those that think it's an overused term because usually we're overusing it because we're saying uh, we're thinking that we can go back to the way it used to be. I guess I get. I just want things to go back to normal. Or we're saying that I guess this is just our new normal, and there's no for there's a, there's a paralyzed paralysis of moving forward with it. We're just stuck. But new in the rebirth is no prior point of reference. Mm. No prior point of reference. So if we have no prior point of reference, we can't use old systems, old thoughts, old ideas to put into a new bucket to get a different output. If we do the same thing over and over again, expecting a different result, we all know it's the definition of. Yeah. Yeah. So, sanity. Sanity. Really so why do we still do it then? Right. Yeah. So that's the, the question. And so now we know that the normal is the everyday typical occurrence of a thought or an action, even though we're showing up in an environment and environments are just environments. They don't shift. They don't change underwater or in outer space. They're just two different environments. How I show up in that environment, though, 
is if I don't have an apparatus to breathe, I'm going to die <laughs> if I don't get back to oxygen again. So I have to bring oxygen into my environment, different part of my model, but we're bringing oxygen into the environment now so that we can survive this, this environment that's new to us. But I still have phantom sensation or phantom pain before the revision. When I had my leg amputated, my reasoning was if I just get rid of my leg, I'll get rid of my pain. After the leg's taken off, I woke up in more pain than I had reasoned. And so we make the commitment. We're like, oh my gosh, I'm out of the frying pan. I'm into the fire. And we want to go back into the frying pan. <laughs> we can't jump back out of the fire. We now have to move forward. And this takes work. And we have to give ourselves what I've coined now, space and grace to grow. So reckoning is, oh, I, uh, something, something has changed. I have to notice that it's different. Uh, revision is, I see a path forward. I have a new picture of what might be on the other side. Re then I take a jump and I go like, okay, I'm going to commit to that new vision. Rebirth is I have made that commitment. I've taken the leap and there's some chasm by which now I can't go back for in some way I've made the commitment where before maybe I could have sort of stayed in this nether world. I wasn't sure whether I was committed or not, but now in the rebirth moment, I, I can't go back. I, I've like quit my other job and I've taken the new one or whatever the, you know, I, now I'm divorced, whatever it is, I can't go back. It doesn't mean everything's hunky-dory. It doesn't mean I'm happy. It doesn't mean all the issues are resolved. It doesn't mean there isn't work to do, but I'm on the other side of the chasm. Am I getting that right? That's right. You've jumped the chasm or crossed the bridge or however you want to say it, and the, and the rope and the bridge poof, it went away and you oh, can't no. go back. Okay. <laughs> <Yikes>. ah! <laughs> okay. And right, it's you still have the same thoughts around it you just made the, the leap you just made the jump uh so now with my artificial leg I'm, i have to i have to learn how to in the new so i'll give you this framework uh or this example i now have to learn how to manipulate a wheelchair to a prosthetic appointment where before i didn't have a wheelchair in my life now i have to learn how to put on an artificial leg now i have to learn how to walk between the parallel bars and in the process of learning how to walk on the artificial leg, parallel bars to a four-bar walker around the hospital, walker to um, crutches, crutches to a cane, cane to free walking, free walking to eventually running, running to jumping, jumping to a medal. The process took seven years. And we want it right now. Just because we make the commitment to something, we think it's, it's already, it's done. Yeah, we hear your story in a 45-minute keynote and we're like, wow, that sounds great. That's what I want to do. In 45 minutes, I want to get from my hardship to my... Right. My daughter was off at college, her transition, and her freshman year of college, she was like, you know, you hear all the inspirational stories, and but I realize you got to have to like live through the hardship so you can have the story. And now here I am living through the hard part. And I was like, wow, that's so brilliant that you know that. <laughs> yes. There, there is no testimony without a test. Ooh, nice. And there's, there's it's always going to be something that challenges us. And the, the, the framing of the resilience and trying to get past this, right, and to, to build the muscle is that they, they happen. I'll explain that the last piece. And the, 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 remind me to, to, to go back to the resilience and how we have to continue to build it. So once we do that, once we give ourselves space and grace to grow and understand the, this new process, we do want to shorten the time. You know, for the business businesses, what I try to do is help them shorten that time so it doesn't take seven years because they don't have seven years, right? right? They need to shift them the mindset faster, but it's tough because you, you're trying to turn something, a new idea, new. It's hard to get everybody on board with that. So that's why I, have, I work with the individual, not necessarily the team, to do it because it's the individual that's going to block it. We've been doing this thirty years. We don't need to be changing nothing. Right. That's hard. Um, so you got to give yourself space and, and, and grace to grow. Once you've done that, 
now you're in the fourth or you're about to hurdle the fourth hurdle and that and these hurdles because in, in hurdles every hurdle comes up faster and faster and faster right so these these are the last two are really quick because you've done the work for the other you've done the work to sprint to the first three uh, and the fourth hurdle is the resolve you have now you're you're in a rhythm you're in the, the next phase of the the hierarchy or the spiral going up you're in the, you're in that next phase and you're at the resolve um, and your language shifts, right? You're not saying like in the reckoning moment, I wish things would get back to normal. I guess this is my new normal, right? You're not saying that anymore. Now you're saying, oh, no, I'm never going back that way. You need to catch up to where I am. So the, 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 the mindset's different with, with this. You can, you can hear it in people uh, because they're, they're, there's a confidence of that they've been through that fire, like your daughter is understanding how to get through that fire. And now what, when she's through it, she could, she, she's more resilient or more, more resolved and, and resolute in who she is, right? Because she's been through it. Uh, no one, you can't take that life experience away from her because she's been through it. It's her, it's her testimony. And then we can reward ourselves for the journey. That's the last one. That's why I said these last two are pretty quick. And we reward ourselves. I won the silver medal in the, in the Paralympic Games. Right? We woo -hoo. We win the silver medal. We win the gold medal. Whatever medal that we're chasing after our life, uh, we we're at that. But that's only a plateau. It's not a destination. I don't camp out with my medals around me all over the house, and and and, and I just sit there with you know to just glaze at the medals for the rest of my life. That would make you insufferable. We're happy you don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> Alice would not be then. happy about that. <laughs> yeah, Just look at look at that metal right there. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Every now and then, I hope you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, you know, it's, it's it's a it's a I'm I look at it through a different lens now because I bring it with me for every presentation because for for several reasons. One, it's because I want people to see that that you can have. A, a finality of this section of life. That's one. Number two, point zero 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 one percent of the population that's going after a medal or tr trying to start. Um, hey, thanks, Lois, for putting that in there. She's got the whole thing in. So, so uh, Lois put this in: reckoning, revision, rebirth, resolve, reward. Uh, so, thank you, Lois. Uh, I thank you. My remember, is it Lewis? I think it's Lewis. Lewis. Lewis is fantastic. He does fantastic. amazing work with neurodivergent populations and has a wonderful yeah. book out, which I have here somewhere. I'll put it in the show notes. I love it. Thank you, Lewis. Thank you so much for putting that in there. So at the so now at the reward, you know, I take that medal with me because many people haven't had the chance to touch the work. 20 years worth of work in this one silver object. And I, I love it. And it teaches me so much more. It reminds me, I don't know if I'd be here if I had if I got the gold medal. Right? I, and the reason I say that is because I don't think I, I would have appreciated what that silver medal actually represents. Because people say, oh, you almost had the gold medal. Almost, you almost won the gold medal. But no. That's assuming... That's the, the gold medalist didn't do everything in his power, in my case, not to win. He was a three-time champion. Wow. It's He's not going to give me the gold medal. <laughs> <laughs> he's going to fight tooth and nail with every trick in the book he has to yeah. win that competition. Yeah. yeah, And it was down to the two of us, right? I jumped five meters 41, which was one centimeter under his world record. He had to either break his world record or tie it or break it to, to beat me. All right. So I can we just say that, like, statistically, you guys are the same. Like, <laughs> I understand that he's like a gold little bit, but like, in actuality, and I, I there's something that feels important to me. I said it earlier about like, you know, the top 100 of you or the top 25, whatever it is, like, on some level, like, I, I know how much it matters, like gold medal, silver medal, like, you know, you three medal and then, you know, there are three of you who medal and then there, and there are only five of you who get to qualify from you, whatever it is. But also, like, there's just these amazing human beings who are doing this amazing feat 
that is extraordinary in its own right. Do you get what I'm trying to say? Like there's a level at which like that measurement is amazing and should be honored. The distinguishing of the first, second, third is uh, deserving yeah. of that honor. And also there's a level at which when we're parsing like that, like it, it's sort of, um, it's, there's a, a level in which maybe this is the sort of not um, competitive athlete in me, but there's another level in which I want to go like, can't we just also admit that you're like just all amazing, uh, you've all um, accomplished yeah. something amazing just by the commitment to get to that level of accomplishment, full stop. I think that, I, I get what you're saying. And I, you know, as most people, when you listen to this podcast, you'll find, especially listen to me, <laughs> I wear a lot of different hats. Yeah. <laughs> and one is on, on disability. Uh, and sometimes I was just having a conversation with Amy Purdy, Dancing with the Stars, snowboard, started snowboarding. This was just yesterday. Uh, you know, she's out there with Oprah Winfrey and on the book tour and all this other stuff. Amazing individual. And we were having a conversation around kind of this topic of inspiration and how we are inspired by some people. But a lot of times people with disabilities, they are the baseline of someone else's inspiration, right? So we call it kind of, you know, our term is inspiration porn, right? So that's kind of, that's what we say in the disability community yeah. that somebody's using our story or something to say, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're out here today. Uh, you're, you're, um, you, you, you inspire me in such a way. I, I'm so glad to see you at the grocery store. I'm, I, that's amazing what you're doing. I'm so glad you're crossing the street. I'm so glad, you know, you're climbing up a, a, a hill. I go up the, the Pikes Peak incline. Oh, you, you, you're, in, you're such an inspiration. I could never do that. And that's the the kind of the, I don't know if it's icky. I won't say that. It's kind of the microaggression. I'll say it that I'll way. I'll say it's icky. <laughs> it's yeah. it's yeah, the microaggression. Yeah, I get it's it. It's microaggression. And so they think they're saying something that's positive, but it's really kind of, you know, you're a doormat just for them to elevate their life on. So we uh, we we do we we give our on Thanksgiving when it comes up on in, in November, right? We we go and we 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 give out turkeys to those that might be less fortunate than ourselves. And and so one group calls that 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 gener that generosity turkey people, because turkey people come around during Thanksgiving, mm. and they give turkeys out to those that they think are less fortunate than them. And they and people will take the turkeys because they're hungry. They need that. And then around the 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 uh, the uh, um, the Christmas tree or the menorah or whatever it is, right? We say, "Look at the good work that we did. We handed out all these turkeys." Mm -hmm. So we step on those to make ourselves feel good mm -hmm. for the inspiration that we think that we're drawing from them. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. Yeah. And so. The reason I share that silver medal is because I want people to see that this as a journey it continues. It's uh, I was not entitled to win the gold medal; I had to earn that. Mm -hmm. But I also earned second, and I also and third per place person earned third, but fourth also earned fourth, fifth, sixth, whatever the the outcome is. And then we shift and we make it different. That's why the at the end of it, the it's a plateau by which we grow. So we learn the lesson. And I can be at the reward at the Paralympic Games in that area of my life. But in my family life, I might be at the at a reckoning moment. In my finances, I might be at a jump to commit to a new investment. Uh, at the re I could be in a rebirth in another area of my life. So it's all layered one across the other. And when I look at the model that is out there, I can now see where somebody else might be on that model that's on my team. Yeah. And it's not for me to say, oh, you need to be over here because I made it over here and I made this commitment, I made this jump. It's to say, going back to your daughter who's going through a test to get a testimony, I empathize where you are. Yeah. I, I know you have a jump to make yeah. and I know I can't make that jump for you. Yeah. But I'm going to be with you here because I had to make a similar jump. And I know it's difficult because you got these other people talking to you and you got society that's pressing upon you and you can't move away from it. But you got this because you, ha you have the right vision. Right. The vision you have can cause you to make this jump. Beautiful. Right. And that's 
the jump. And I'm going to be with you in the rebirth. I'm going to be with you and help you grow in this new thing because you can't go back the other way after you make the commitment, right? So that's the catch we want to. We want to shorten that jump that they have to make the landing for them. So the reward is, part of the reward is the reward. You won and feel very proud of what you won, the actual accomplishment of a silver medal. And one of the things I hear you saying is, you are proud of your silver medal and you clear that that's what you won, right? It's not like an, you almost, an almost gold or right. just a bronze, like you won your silver medal and that, that is good enough. Like that is an amazing accomplishment and you're very proud of it. And that's what it is. Uh, the other thing that I, that the reward is about is a uh, paying it forward or the, some total of the accomplishment of the entire journey and everything that you learned uh, and achieved and now understand the, the all of the fruit of all of those seeds and all of that experience that you now have internalized mm -hmm. and that you have access to as you you know interact with others and are paying it forward and we've heard your stories of how you've done that in all sorts of ways and you can be available. You can be the Yoda or, you know, the for the next yeah. Han Solo or, right. I probably didn't get that right, the next uh, Luke Skywalker. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. And I think there's a third one as well. And the third one is we can make an assessment and we can go back, not to try to change the result or actually wanting to change the result. We can say, what did I miss that may have gotten me a better result. Can't go back and change it, but you use it as a forecasting for the next, mm -hmm. right? Who else did I need? What better questions could I have asked? Um, who else could, you know, but because some of the people in my sphere of influence didn't know the questions that were in my head that I need, that I didn't know at the time to ask to actually give me a different result. The doctor, the doctor makes an above the knee amputation which is okay. We don't, I don't think about it too much right there. But if he knows I, I desire to be an athlete, maybe he makes a through the knee amputation so I can weight bear on the bottom portion of my stump to give me more power to equal more speed and more frequency to win the medal that I'm going to eventually do six years, seven years down the road from this to give me the most optimum time. Yeah. And I'm coming for you, Mr. Gold Medal. Coming for you, right? <laughs> So he, he, he understands that in the case it's Dr. Mullins, he's a he. And so he understands that the incision or the amputation he makes can set me up for future success. Right. Right. Of what I want to do. So that's one. Is that that decision, the four and a half inches, I win silver and not gold? Or is it the extension stop in my knee, my running leg? Extension stop stops the leg from going into hyperextension, which puts stress on the cylinder unit, the knee unit that I am running on, which pulls it out of the, the entire sock, the whole housing unit, because I'm putting so much force on that knee. No one else is kind of really doing it, but I am because I know how to run. And so I'm breaking it like every time it comes back. And so I'm down for four to six, about five or six months, sending this unit back and forth. And the third time it goes back, it says, the, the, the manufacturer says, why aren't you using the extension stopper? What's that? <laughs> right? So in that world where they, under, if they knew how I used to run and they now see me running or they came out to watch me run, they said, you need that extension stopper on it because you're going to keep blowing these, these new unit outs. The, you, you. So that is that six months time, five, six months. Is that the time I lost in training, the four and a half inches that I win silver and not gold? And finally, viscosity in the knee. By the time I'm learning how to run and I'm really good and I'm in my resolve in the running moment, I've done the work and I'm not the resolve and I'm running free and I can, I'm, I'm moving quick. I'm overpowering the leg. I'm faster than what the leg can actually respond back. Having more viscosity in the knee will make the leg come back faster, the knee come back faster, faster and faster. So I can, I, can, I should be able to train faster. I didn't find out about more viscosity until seven days prior to my jump in Sydney, Australia. So they overnighted 
a new knee unit to me from the company. I put it in. I'm flying down the track now. I have to go to another track to redo all of my run up because I am no longer the same person. I've, I've gone a, another level. What if I would have had that just three months earlier? Right. Right. Is that the four and a half inches that I won silver and not gold by? So I take that not to change the results because I don't have access to that information, but who do I need in my world right now in order for me to elevate to the next goal that I have in my life? Who are the people I'm surrounding myself with? And can I ask the right questions of them so they understand me better? So I take full advantage of all the opportunities that are before me. How do I, and this is a tricky one, isn't it? How do I look back? How do I review from this place of reward, not with regret, not trying to change something and learn from whatever happened to trans, to take into whatever the next moment of change that I'm going to have to navigate because everything is temporary. Everything's going to be changing all the time. There will be the next thing, right? We may be in it already, yeah. right? Right, right, how right. Do, how do I use like, oh, I'm going to need experts. I know there are going to be people who know more about this, who've been here before me. So, you know, what, how do I take that and learn and, and, Pay, pay it forward to myself as well as to other people. So in, in the military, we have what's called recovery. So we go off, we do an exercise, and you just do the exercise, right? Whether you're you're moving to point of contact or your, your, your exercise is to just do a salute report, size, activity, location, unit, time, and activity on somebody. You go back and make that report, whatever the, the activity is. And then after it's over with, you come back and you debrief it in an AAR, an act, an, 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 act, an, an action, an army review. So it's a, it's a review, and you review everything that went on. I think the, the the Blue Angels do it after every every time they fly. The 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 um the Air Force does it after every time they fly. You're always you can't correct what happened up there, but you can correct for what's coming up in the future. Yes. And the more that you do that the more you know, the better questions to ask and know who to bring into your sphere of influence so that you can you can have a, a more well-rounded uh, push forward to the next thing that might be uncertain to you right now, but is coming up. Yeah. Uh, so that's that's the way I do it uh, and surrounding myself with those individuals. Like oh, yeah. I surround myself with you. We were just, oh, and I with you. We were just talking in at the improv theater about giving notes after our improv show. So, you know, in the theater, if you're doing a scripted show, your director gives you notes and those notes are very easy to give in some ways, right? It's like, say, you know, you said this line, here's a thought about how you say that line, or here's the blocking where you stand and how you move, like, let's shift it this way, or, you know, this movement of the set didn't work. But when you're improvising, the it's like life, right? The scene is going to be different every time. It's going to mm -hmm. you. So what? How do you give notes? Like what are the notes? You can't say when you do that scene you did, say it this way, or move here, or play that character differently because it's different every time. So it's about it's not saying oh I wish I could do that scene differently or I would have said this or I would have responded this way. It's about what are the principles that we learned? What are the skills that we want to employ? What do we learn from that experience that will translate to a new and different experience? But there are patterns and there are skills and their mindsets that we can then apply. And it sounds like that's what you're talking about in life. Absolutely. Because when, you know, gold military term, I think it was General Patton who said it, you know, when the first shot goes off, you're managing chaos. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and then you, you figure out what worked after right, that's worked. Right. Well, um, I, uh, I, um, Eisenhower, I think, said, right? I, planning is I, imperative. I, the plan is useless. So. Right. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but, you, but you have a plan, right? You have a, a way, you have a framing of what you want to do, but it's not going to go exactly the way you want it to go, right? Um, speaking of the plan not going exactly the way we wanted it to go, we are well over an hour because there was so much to talk about. Uh, it is usually in our plan to play a game. Shall we, should we play a game? Uh, yeah, let's play the game. Uh, we, we will not be on for like hours. I think when I interview Kat, we might go on for another hour as well. But um, 
but I think it's it's this is part of the what we do that's unique to our show. Uh, so Kat is uh, this. If you look her up, she's one of these, the most amazing improver in the United States in the world. I would argue to say, uh, she works with amazing companies. Uh, I won't say the company names, but they're really you would know them if you heard them. Uh, and and she works with their teams to advance by using her techniques. And so one of the things that we have access to is this brilliance. And you know I don't know what she ever is, is going to say in the game that's going to come up. So yeah. it's total improv what we do. And when we invite guests on, we have them play as well. So that's a unique thing that we do on Performance Shift. All right, John. So I, I'm going to play any improvisers out there, and there are many, many exceptional elite gold medal uh, applied improvisers and performance improvisers out there. Uh, will know this game. This is it. This is a game that um, many improvisers learn the very first day they go to an improv class, and it's a game that we improvisers who've been doing it for decades and decades still use as a warm-up game or as a performance game because it is sort of the heart of uh, being present in the moment and having to pivot and deal with change and the unexpected and respond to it right in the moment. And it's called Word at a Time Story or Word at a Time Expert. It just it goes uh, as simply as we are going to tell a story one word at a time. So you'll say a word, I'll say a word, you'll say a word, I'll say a word. Every word um, counts. There are no good words or bad words. It's just whatever word is net necessary next. So if the word is a uh, or the, that is as good a word as a transformation. Um, and uh, I don't, you, you know, there, there are people here and someone wants to put a, a title of a story or something to tell a story about into the chat if there's someone there then we can use that as our inspiration if somebody does that uh i don't know who's that we have four we have one person we have four five people i think that are on right now so if All somebody right. gets a word suggestion right now because my armpits are like sweating right now because i'm, I'm like what, what's gonna happen we've never done this together <laughs> at all i'm completely yeah, putting john on the spot but i know so given I all know. the things you've heard about john you know that he can handle this uh let's see i don't no one's putting anything in the chat all right, right now well let's, let's, i let's, see let's what, what? We'll just go. Just, just okay. Go also. Yeah. So I see. Um, I see. Uh, I have a lipstick here. So our, that's okay. going to be the inspiration for our story. Lipstick. Lipstick. Right. Okay. There. Once. Was. A. Lipstick. Salesperson. Who. Sold. Out. Of. All. Her. Product. One. Day she was so confused that she begged to sell some ice cream, taking the ice cream to a market, she smeared. It on some lips. Then people began celebrating this delicious ice cream. There began to be dances all over the market place. Uh, Jennifer, who was the sales person, um, became enthralled with a new idea. Ice cream could be the new market for lipstick. <laughs> and that's the end of the story. <laughs> Ta -da! Ta -da! It was, and it was about transformation. Who knew? Right. <laughs> <laughs> Stories of our lives. Yeah. Well, this has been great. Thanks for asking me the question. I know I, you know, I tend to. I'm a speaker, so I go, I go long. <laughs> I got to tell the story. <laughs> it was my fault. I asked you so many, like, wait, let's go here. Wait, let's go there. I did not keep us on track. But it's good. I want to listen to it over myself because I want to see what I said versus what I think I said. Yeah, no, no, no. It's a, a, you put a speaker and an improviser together, we are not going to keep on track. Like. 
But I love that. You know, it's it's just the dumping, like even in the activity, right? It's taking everything out and listening for the cues that you're giving me to build upon. Um, and I didn't think I was going to be able to do it because I saw you all at Mopco uh, when I was able to go to Albany and Schenectady. I love saying yeah. that word, Schenectady. <laughs> Uh, to your theater and just watching the brilliance and people in their element and pushing themselves, even though they didn't have it, you know, right. It wasn't perfect and things. And, but just committing to the scene or committing to uh, the, the new thought and, um, and just unfiltered, just, just moving. I, I thought it was brilliant. It was great to have you there. And uh, yeah, it's, um, you know, we today we talked through your framework and what's delightful for us is to see the synergy between the stages of what you're talking about and that you've outlined and then the skills and mindsets and muscles, right, that we're exercising as impro improvisers and how they can help at all of those various stages in various ways. So we'll continue to chat about that and continue Absolutely. to bring on awesome guests to help us do that. So I want to honor just a few folks that did come on. We didn't get them a chance to do that. And then we're going to close the show out. So one was Amy C. Horner. And what she said is your existing world was snapped. This was back in the, mm. we're talking about the story. Your subsequent world was pretty, your subsequent world has become pretty cool, my friend. <laughs> so yes. she is a brilliant person. She's going through her PhD right now. And then we had um, Louis, um, Chesney. Louis Chesney. Yep. Thanks for sharing that, he says. And uh, we had great conversation. And then Lois, Lewis said, reckoning, revision, rebirth, resolve, and reward. Again, so yeah. staying right on that one. So appreciate all those that had come on and shared with us. We have more people that are watching. So that's great on the live show. Um, so that's it for this, this episode of Performance Shift. We hope you enjoyed this discussion and gained some valuable insights that you can apply to your own work in life. If you want to learn more about the power of transformation, how you can shift your own performance to achieve your goals and dreams, be sure to subscribe to our podcast and join us for our next episode, which is every Saturday morning at 930 Eastern time. That's right. Thank you for being here. Um, if you want to uh, reach us by email, you can do that at hello at performance shift podcast dot com. I think. Or you can just reach out to us directly, John at John at johnregister.com, cat at cat at cat at coppet.com. Um, we should be in your podcast feeds. If we're not, we will be soon, or just find us here on LinkedIn. Um, you can share this after the fact if you didn't catch us live. And we'll look forward to seeing you next week. All right. Thanks a lot, everybody. Go forth and inspire your world. We'll talk to you soon. Bye for now. Bye.